Uh, for now, I would like to introduce, um, for an update on the Canadian Internet Forum, I would like to introduce Byron Holland. Byron is the President of, and Chief Executive Officer of CIRA. Il est au service de l'organisation depuis maintenant six ans. Pendant cette période, il a supervisé de nombreuses initiatives d'importance, notamment un remaniement global de tout le registre .ca, ainsi que des politiques et des règles administratives. Byron a aussi orchestré la première mise en valeur du domaine de premier niveau .ca à titre de produit, en y ajoutant des caractères français accentués. Merci beaucoup pour ça, euh, dans les noms de domaines. Byron a élaboré une représentation internationale robuste pour Internet au Canada et le nom de domaine de premier niveau .ca. Il préside la Country Codes Name Supporting Organization, C'est l'organisme qui représente les intérêts de tous les domaines nationaux auprès de l'ICANN. Il tient aussi un blog populaire à l'échelle internationale, Some of you might know his blog, Public Domain, uh, in which he communicates his points of view uh, concerning the, uh, the uh, future of the Internet and important aspects for uh, the Canadian population. Byron, if you want to come to the stage. You can, you can, uh, a little hand of applause for Mr. Byer. Thank you. Thank you. Merci pour uh, cette introduction. Uh, C'est toujours un plaisir de visiter Montréal. Montréal est un joueur important du secteur de la haute technologie en Amérique du Nord. Et avec, entre autres, son industrie du développement de jeux vidéo et logiciels. Et je suis très heureux de souligner que c'est aussi la ville haute du plus euh, récent point d'échange Internet du Canada. That, for us, is a great event. Since this is the second Canadian Internet Forum of 2013, I was a little bit worried that there wouldn't be a lot for me to update. It is, after all, usually an annual event, and as we all know, over the summers in Canada can be a little bit low key. As it turns out, I had nothing to worry about. I think it's safe to say that the past few months have been some of the busiest and most dynamic in the history of the public internet. And while a couple of months ago I was actually very encouraged about the state of the internet or the future of the internet, ICANN was in pretty good shape after several years of turmoil. As we heard, the Wicket meeting uh, in the end, I think, came to the right conclusions. And as a result, we saw the general internet public talking about internet governance and all things internet in a way that uh, we'd never seen really before. I mean, the concept of internet governance was almost, dare I say it, becoming mainstream. And listen, when you live and breathe and work in the internet governance space, and, and you believe that this is truly critical to the social and economic well-being of the world, um, having people outside this small industry talk about it and get engaged in it, see it in the mainstream media, is incredibly encouraging. It was, you know, something that I almost uh, thought I, I might never see in my lifetime. But then, wham, we get the revelation that the American government, uh, through the PRISM program, has been monitoring the internet traffic coming and going from the United States. And as a Canadian organization with the responsibility for managing uh, significant components of the internet, we were concerned with the revelation that much much of the world's internet communications are under one jurisdiction surveillance. And let's not kid ourselves. Those of us in the internet space are certainly aware that uh, various regimes and certainly the Americans are surveilling internet traffic. But I think it's the breadth, the depth, <coughs> the lack of transparent, independent judicial oversight over those programs that was really what was so breathtaking for all of us in and around and concerned in the, in, uh, about the space. And certainly, you know, if you use the social media networking sites like Facebook and Twitter, 
Your information there is also stored on a server south of the border, most likely. So Canadians are really impacted, and I would argue probably more than most any other state in the world, are really impacted by the NSA's or National Security Agency's internet monitoring program. And it does matter. I'd like to point out uh, two key points before I go much further. First, the, obviously the Canadian government, as all governments, uh, operate an online surveillance program. But as a nation, we don't believe we have a, a, a program with the, the breadth and depth, certainly, that we've seen south of the border, like PRISM. Although, as we've heard today, you know, uh, facts on that are, are literally changing as we speak. But secondly, and this is a point that I think often gets missed in these types of discussions, and that's that the government has a right and a responsibility to protect its citizens, all governments. And surveillance has always been uh, one of the tools in a government's tool bag to protect its citizens. So be it phone taps or uh, opening the mail, remember envelopes, stamps on the front, opening the mail and looking inside it. Surveillance has been around a very long time. And we as a society accept it in free and democratic nations because the authorities can't do it without some sort of judicial or independent oversight. And that's the fair balance. That's the compromise that we make between privacy and security, normally. And that's where the surveillance activities of the NSA may differ, I think likely differ. The PRISM program, from what we know, is certainly operates with minimal judicial oversight, and I think we can definitely say without any transparent oversight. So I say that this matters to Canadians for a couple of reasons. First is really is, is the macro reason. And as Paul Brigner uh, mentioned this morning in his talk about international internet governance, the ITU's wicket last December in Dubai was a really important event. Most, actually all of what we would consider the democratic nations of the world banded together to ensure that the ITU was not able to materially extend its uh, oversight into the internet governance space. I was at that conference. And I heard firsthand the American delegation defend the current governance system. And I, I know, I personally know most of the people in that delegation and in the internet governance space for the US government. And I believe that they truly believe in what they were saying at that point. That's simply my opinion. But really what they were getting behind and strongly supporting was the multi-stakeholder governance model. And based on the fact that some of the proposals at the conference would have um, started to allow various governments in a treaty, and therefore by regulation later, to start to monitor some of the, behav the, the behavior and internet activity of their citizens, the US government strongly advocated on behalf of the multi-stakeholder model, in essence, trying to mitigate the reach of the ITU into the internet governance space. The proposals, they argued, called for a system that could enable um, countries which do not have a uh, strong tradition of human rights or democracy to put in place regimes, regulatory regimes, based on treaties, um, uh, programs that would enable significant online surveillance for those kinds of regimes. And that would be treaty-based and regulation supported. So think about that. 10 months ago, the United States was leading the so-called free world or democratic nations to block an international treaty based on the fact that it could enable governance, governments to monitor their citizens on the internet. Not solely, but in part, that was part of the argument. It formed a major part of their argument to maintain the multi-stakeholder model, a system that at the time we certainly thought uh, is a key part of ensuring that open and free internet. A 
and yet it's the same government that turns out is monitoring almost all in and outbound uh, internet traffic transiting its borders, which given the distributed nature of the internet means much of the global internet traffic. I think we could ask ourselves, has the US government negated one of the most important and strongest arguments for maintaining the current system of internet governance? They may have. I think it's an open question right now, the kind of question that we want to have discussion about today. And keep in mind, this is also the, the, the governance structure that's put two and a half billion people online in the last decade or slightly over. And the internet governance system that we thought would, was about to put the next two and a half billion people online and offer all of those people the social and economic benefits that those of us who are currently online have already received. And I think, of course, that with these revelations, we've opened the door, at least, or we've helped open the door to criticism and attacks on our current governance model, the multi-stakeholder model. But I think there's another reason to be concerned about internet surveillance. Well, there are a number, but another. And it's a lot simpler than the esoteric world of global internet governance. It's just one word, in fact. Privacy. Privé. Chez nous, nous mettons des rideaux à nos fenêtres. There's a reason we have curtains on our windows. Pour la même raison, nous utilisons des, des mots de passe pour protéger nos informations privées en ligne. Nous avons tout le droit à notre vie privée. Et la surveillance en ligne affecte ce droit. In August, we conducted a survey uh, with Canadians about online surveillance. And I have to tell you, we were somewhat surprised by the response that we received. In fact, half of Canadians, almost half of Canadians, uh, believe it's acceptable for governments to monitor their email and online activities in some circumstances. And when those circumstances include, you know, quote, preventing terrorist attacks, it rises to 77%. Over three quarters of Canadians are okay with the government monitoring uh, our online activity as long as it's tied to the interest of national security. Who finds that number surprising? I, I do. So uh, interestingly, just from what I can see, it's probably representative of what we saw here in the study. But let me tell you why I find it surprising. You know, for one reason, again, at a macro level, I think for many decades, we in the West vilified authoritarian regimes that would use tactics like surveillance in all of its forms without any kind of judicial oversight or warrant or anything like that. Think of the names that are on that list. The Stasi from East Germany, the KGB from Russia, Communist Party in China. And little over a, over a generation ago, we in the West were literally willing to go to war albeit a Cold War, but a war nonetheless, at least in part over the degree of state control uh, or the degree of state control that these regimes had over their citizens. And yet today, half of us seem okay with our regimes monitoring us online, our behavior online, our emails, our personal correspondence online. And since we released, uh, since we released this information, or this research paper, which is available online or at our website, cira.ca. Um, I've been asked numerous times about it, and, and often I get the, uh, what I would call the old chestnut, look, you've got nothing to hide. It's fine. What's the problem, right? Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's many problems with that particular argument. Um, but one of them is, well, you know what? Maybe from time to time there are things that we should hide or at least we don't necessarily want to share. So okay, three quarters of, gov three quarters of us are fine with, uh, with governments monitoring our online activities as long as they're to prevent terrorism. Now, I could use a number of examples why I think that potentially this is, uh, 
a debate that needs to be had in the open uh, but, and why this can be a problem. But at least let me lead with this one. Let me ask you a question. Since this is the word that gets used the most, what's terrorism? Name a terrorist organization. Al-Qaeda? Yeah. Definitely. What about the African National Congress, the ANC? Probably wouldn't say that was one today. But Nelson Mandela was jailed for 27 years for his activities related to the ANC. Now, in 2013, I'd probably be highly suspect of anybody who calls the ANC a terrorist organization. But back at its outset, certainly many people were. How about the Occupy movement, environmental movement? Maybe not so much. Uh, we just celebrated 50 years of the civil rights movement. What about Martin Luther King? Was he a terrorist at the time? I imagine most of us, hopefully all of us, would say no. But in King's lifetime, the security establishment in the US, the FBI in particular, conducted extensive surveillance on him, including phone taps and the like. And can you imagine if they'd had the technology then that they have today? Uh, I, I think it's pretty safe to say somebody in the security establishment would be looking at his emails. And it's entirely believable that the civil rights movement of the 60s could have very easily taken a different shape or form had that been the case. Would it have been as successful as it is? Hard to say, but it likely would have had a different flavor to it. And this could have, I just use that as an example. It's not about rights movements, but you could certainly apply it to the union movement or something more current, perhaps the gay and lesbian rights movement that we, we currently have in the, po in the popular media. And my point here is twofold. First, times change. Political movements that at one time may, may have seemed like they were really pushing the margins of law can become very mainstream. And second, I think that pushing the boundaries, but not crossing, legal boundaries, but not crossing, can be healthy to a democracy. It creates that creative tension, that creative friction that helps us build a vibrant, open, transparent democracy. And as history tells us, and the civil rights movement certainly demonstrates, it's easy for authorities to be too keen to monitor the movements that push the margins. And in the case of Mandela, jail them. And we certainly know that worse has happened over time. But I think you know, that was just one example. The, the, the importance of privacy uh, can be equally applied to many areas, many sectors, the business sector as well. Um, and, and think of the social sectors or spheres where privacy we think of as a right, but yet somehow it's morphing as we apply this layer of technology to it. Take it to business, for example. The corporations need to keep strategies or distribution channels or market penetration strategies secret. Should they be allowed to do it? I think uh, where it really hits home, I think, is, is particularly in the high tech sector. Because more than anything, a company's value is wrapped up in its intellectual property. And in the digital age, ideas have great value. And those ideas, I think, are really at risk if an uninvited third party can gain unauthorized access to them. Let me put it even more pragmatically. I think there are times and places where governments don't have any business. And I think probably this audience in particular will recall quite a famous Montrealer who once said, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. Now, that was a very specific reference, but I think we could expand and use it almost as a, as a broader metaphor today. Uh, and in fact, I recently wrote to, in an opinion piece in the National Post, and I called on Canadians to have a national dialogue about surveillance in the digital world. And while I believe that Canada does not have a surveillance regime akin to the, uh, to the one in the US, we do have the opportunity right now to have this important discussion about what is acceptable to us, what is the fair and appropriate balance before we find ourselves in the kind of situation that they found themselves in south of the border. 
And that's why, hopefully, I can help inspire you and, and us today to have that conversation. You know, the internet is far too important. As we saw in Wicked in Dubai, it's far too important to be left to uh, technocrats, global technocrats behind closed doors. And I believe this is also true with regard to how much of our privacy we're willing to give up to authorities. It's our internet. It's our information. In the 70s, we had a national discussion about the role of law enforcement uh, after the October crisis. You know, illegal phone taps, uh, uh, opening letter mail without any kind of warrant or judicial oversight. And it actually led to a royal commission and ultimately to a new agency, CSIS. Les temps ont changé et euh, la technologie aussi. À présent, 40 ans plus tard, c'est le temps de recommencer cette discussion. Pour ce faire, je vous propose le Forum canadien de notre recherche. Parlez en à vos amis et à votre famille. Cet Internet, c'est le vôtre. Participez. Thank you and merci.